1992, Francis Fukuyama's book The End of History and the Last Man was published in the United States. This work made Fukuyama famous all over the world. The philosopher and political scientist argued that the spread of Western-style liberal democracy proves that the socio-cultural evolution of humanity has come to an end. No more grand ideological confrontation, global revolution and war. There will be nothing beyond liberal democracy, as it is precisely this form of statehood that most effectively satisfies the needs of the individual and his desire for dignity and personal freedom. Authoritarianism, Fukuyama wrote, is in crisis and will soon be forced to surrender. After the book's publication, the young writer became an intellectual rock star in the United States. George Bush relied heavily on his work, but after the September 11th attack, the president's administration came to the conclusion that passively waiting for liberalism to win was ineffective and that democracy could instead be imposed by force. Fukuyama was both criticized and showered with praise, and he still is to this day. Now, an internationally acclaimed political scientist and philosopher, he works at Stanford University and continues to insist on the validity of his own claims from the early 90s. Right now, the whole world can see Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, Recep Erdogan, Viktor Orban, Donald Trump and other leaders of varying degrees of authoritarianism prove that dictatorship remains attractive and contagious. And the wars that should have ended continue to erupt and even threaten the very existence of humanity. Francis Fukuyama joins us live. Hello, it's a great honor to be here with you today. You write in the recent article for The Atlantic, Ukrainians are fighting a large battle on our behalf, a battle that all of us need to join. Us, meaning the Western world. How should the democratic world join this battle? I think that uh, the democratic world has already joined the battle in many ways by supporting Ukraine through the supply of weapons, through intelligence sharing, through economic support, and through political support. Uh, I think that Europe particularly is heading towards a very difficult time because of the Russian cutoff of gas supplies and the sanctions, but I think that uh, politically it's important to maintain solidarity uh, over the winter, difficult as that may be. Uh, ultimately, uh, reducing dependence on Russian gas and oil uh, is going to be critical because that's really what fuels the Russian ability to continue this um, invasion of Ukraine. So that is what is already being done. But in your opinion, is there anything else that can be done to get Vladimir Putin to retreat? Vladimir Putin отступить. Well, uh, there's always more weapons uh, that Ukraine needs. Uh, right now, I think the critical need is for modern air defense systems because of Russia's bombardment of Ukrainian cities and infrastructure with drones and uh, rockets. And I'm afraid more of these are coming from Iran and from uh, other places. And so that's probably the most critical uh, defense need. Uh, I think there's also a matter of deterrence because uh, Putin has indirectly threatened the use of nuclear weapons. And I think it's important that uh, the United States and other NATO countries make clear that there will be uh, very bad consequences for Russia if uh, a nuclear weapon is actually used. That would obviously uh, isolate Russia completely and put the whole conflict onto a different plane. And I think that's something that Russia should not do and it's not in Russia's interest to do. The fact that it isn't in anyone's interest is probably obvious to everyone, except maybe Vladimir Putin himself. From what you've observed, going back to the past few years even, not just the past eight months of Putin's rule, do you have confidence in him not using the nuclear option? Or, like many others, myself included, do you believe that he's capable of and even prepared for this radical step? Is the world adequately prepared for this? I uh, <clears throat> really don't think that he's likely to escalate to nuclear weapons because the consequences for Russia and for him personally are going to be very, very severe. 
I think that the use of a nuclear weapon is likely to trigger direct conflict uh, with the United States and NATO and not simply, you know, via weapons supply. Uh, if you look at Putin's behavior, he is a big risk taker, but there are limits. And so, for example, he didn't order the mobilization until September 21st, uh, despite the obvious need for more manpower. He hasn't started going after Ukrainian infrastructure until this past week. Uh, and that, to me, indicates a caution on his part. Furthermore, uh, Russia's tactical nuclear weapons are stored in certain sites, and there's been no evidence uh, that anyone there is making preparations to move them out of those sites and then uh, put them on the missiles that would be needed to actually use them. So, you know, I think that we need to worry very much about <clears throat> the use of nuclear weapons, but the threat of nuclear weapons is actually now a form of blackmail to try to intimidate uh, Ukraine and its Western backers into engaging in some kind of negotiation to freeze the conflict. And I don't think that that's uh, something that should happen. In 1992, in your famous book, The End of History and the Last Man, you argued that liberal democracy has become the final form and end point of human government. After all these years, you stand by your argument and deny making any erroneous claims. Yet Vladimir Putin has been in power since 1999. We see other authoritarian leaders, dictators and tyrants all over the world as well. How do you explain it? How uh, do Well, the progress of uh, history is never uh, uniform or linear. That is to say, it doesn't keep getting a little bit better every single year. Sometimes we have very big setbacks. We had huge setbacks in the 1930s and then again in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, so I don't think anyone should assume that things will always be getting better. And we've clearly been in a 15-year period where there's been a regression in democracy around the world. However, uh, I think that there are real reasons why, in the end, uh, democracy is a better political system. If you have a dictatorship built around a single individual, uh, the way Russia and China do, you're much likelier to make mistakes. And I think Putin is the best example of this. His invasion of Ukraine, I think, was one of the biggest strategic mistakes that I've witnessed in my lifetime. Uh, and it could only have been made by a dictator that was very isolated, lacking in information and unwilling to bounce ideas off of uh, colleagues. And as a result, uh, Russia has ended up in this enormous crisis. Uh, and that indicates, I think, you know, why democratic decision making uh, is better. It may be slower, but in the end, it's more solid and it reflects a, a bigger consensus within the society. Considering his recent political missteps, how do you see the final stages of Vladimir Putin's political career playing out? Well, that's something that uh, we can speculate about, but I don't think any of us has any idea, you know, what's happening within the Kremlin or within the uh, elite circles uh, uh, surrounding Mr. Putin. Uh, we do know that there's been a lot of unhappiness about the way that the war has been conducted. Uh, there's been a lot of resistance to the mobilization, uh, a lot of criticism of the military, but, you know, there's, there's no way of knowing uh, how he's going to uh, come out of this. I think, however, that uh, a further military defeat of Russia in Ukraine is going to lead to changes. Uh, this is what happened in 1905. This is what happened in 1917. Uh, there's a lot of precedent for failure on the battlefield resulting in political changes at the top, uh, but how that unfolds, uh, I think, is impossible to say at this moment. 
Как вы думаете, после Путина... What do you think is coming after Putin? We can speculate on what will happen to him in the end, but more importantly, how does Russia come out of that situation? Политического положения. Well, you're right that... Um... Future for Russia, that is to say, Russians who want a better future for Russia, uh, organize and mobilize and resist uh, to the extent they can. I know that that is extremely difficult given the Russian state's uh, repressive apparatus, but I think that in the end, uh, that is necessary. And, you know, there are people in Russia that would like to have a more open uh, society and less dictatorship. Uh, and so, you know, they're the ones that have to really um, struggle for it. To follow on from that, you've likely heard the theory that Russian people have a certain form of slavery in their DNA, that the history of Russia proves that people will never be ready for a real democracy, that people would never elect a democratic leader who values freedom. Would you agree? Well, no, uh, I think that uh, you know, that kind of determinism means that it, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if you believe that nothing can change, nothing ever will change. Uh, and it's important not to adopt that kind of fatalistic position. Uh, I personally know many Russians that really want a different future for Russia, that want democracy and a more open society. And I don't think there's any inevitability uh, to Russia remaining the way that it is. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it may take the stimulus of an outside event to actually bring this about. So what do you mean exactly by an external stimulus? What could lead to the breaking point? Well, um, you know, clearly the war itself uh, as in previous generations, is uh, a major development. Uh, and there are very few big wars that didn't lead to some kind of political change. And so I do think that this war is probably going to trigger uh, uh, changes. I think that also it's changed the attitudes of many people in the West on the outside who now see how dangerous Putin is and how dangerous Russia under such a leader can be. And so there's been much more solidarity uh, uh, among democratic countries to resist this. And that's also, I think, an important change for the better. Uh, I think that continuing aggression is going to be met with stronger responses from now on. Uh, and that could have an effect on uh, Russia's ability to manipulate uh, the outside world and to manipulate its own people. Would you agree that tyranny and authoritarianism is infectious, that they're often attractive even? Recently, we see more and more cases where people elect incredibly controversial and despotic leaders. How can we explain this? I think that... Um, We've gone through a prolonged period in Europe and in the United States uh, and other Western countries of relative peace and stability. And I think in periods like that, uh, people begin to take for granted their institutions and they assume that that peace and stability is going to last forever. And then they start uh, having other kinds of uh, hopes and objectives. You know, they don't want to be simply a free people, but they want to emphasize uh, nationalism or religion or uh, some other narrower form of community. And this, I think, has driven many of the populist movements that you see 
uh, all over the world in Europe uh, and also here in the United States. Uh, it reflects, I think, um, uh, a kind of forgetting about what the alternative to liberal democracy really is. Uh, one thing I think that Putin has done is to show uh, to the rest of the world what it means to live in a real dictatorship. Many people, uh, populist nationalists in Europe and the United States think that they are living in a dictatorship uh, and they haven't really experienced a real dictatorship and now they've got one uh, in front of their eyes. And so I think that is a useful lesson. People often argue in Russia and the West about whether Russians should be held collectively responsible for the war in Ukraine, for Putin, for what Russia has become. Do you agree? Well, I don't believe in collective responsibility. I think that each individual has uh, the capacity to make uh, moral choices and that people ought to be judged on the basis of their individual actions. I know many liberal Russians that, uh, um, you know, have been resisting Putin. I was actually supposed to come to Moscow in 2020 at the invitation of uh, Alexei Navalny, and we were going to have a, uh, a event in Moscow together. Uh, and I don't think that, uh, you know, putting everybody in the same category uh, uh, is uh, is a good idea. And what should be the Western approach to Russians? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the West needs to distinguish between Russians who support the war, uh, who support Putin and those who don't. Uh, and make decisions about travel and visas and that sort of thing on that basis. I think that, um, you know, there are many people, including the people that uh, produce TV rain that have been driven out of Russia. And I think uh, these people are doing a very good job in providing an alternative view of Russia. And obviously they need to be treated differently from people who, you know, uh, continue to support Putin despite the fact that, uh, you know, they can travel and, and move about freely in, uh, in the West. Uh, so making distinctions based on uh, your behavior, I think, is very important. Thank you very much. That was Francis Fukuyama, political scientist, philosopher and director of the Center of Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law at Stanford University, live for TV Rain.